We're going to get into the word for a little while now. And, um, you know, Paul says in Philippians, he, he, he prays a prayer. He says, that I may know him. Paul's greatest goal, Paul's greatest desire, the thing that, that superseded everything else was that he would know God. Now, I want to say to you, everyone, God wants you to know him. He doesn't want you to know just about him. He doesn't just want you to have a knowledge in your head about him. He wants you to know him. And I've been very stirred in my heart afresh about the great I am statements. You know, when we were in Exodus, we looked in uh, one of those chapters, chapter 16, where the Lord says, I am that heals you. I am the Lord that heals you. Jehovah Rapha. We're familiar with that one. And you may be familiar with others like uh, the, the one we love, uh, uh, I am the Lord that provides, Jehovah Jireh or Yahweh Yireh. Uh, depends how you pronounce it. I'm no Hebrew scholar, so I won't get it right, but we, we anglicize it, don't we? And there are these wonderful statements, Psalm 23, verse 1, when David says, the Lord is my shepherd, in the Hebrew, it's literally Jehovah Rohi. I am the Lord that is your shepherd. <clears throat> well, today, I want you to turn in the book of Judges, and we're going to have a look at another one of those I am statements. And we may actually... In this season, I might stay with this for a while, but I want you to turn to Joshua, sorry, Judges, not Joshua, Judges chapter 6, and it's the story of Gideon. And after Gideon had had his encounter with the Lord, the angel of the Lord, he asked the Lord to wait. And he makes a sacrifice. <clears throat> he offers a sacrifice to the Lord. And this is the little section about what happened. And so Judges chapter 6, verse 22. Um, actually, we'll just go back a little bit. Um, verse 18. Do not depart from here, I pray, until I come to you and bring out my offering. And set it before you. And he said, I will wait until you come back. So Gideon went and prepared a young goat and unleavened bread from an ephah of flour. The meat he put in a basket, he put the broth in a pot, and he brought them out to him under the terebinth tree and presented them. The angel of God said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened bread and lay them on this rock and pour out the broth. And he did so. And the angel of the Lord put out the end of his staff that was in his hand touched the meat and the unleavened bread, and fire rose out of the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened bread. Supernatural fire of God appeared at that point in time. And Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. And Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for I've seen the angel of the Lord face to face. And the Lord said to him, <clears throat> Peace be with you. Do not fear. You shall not die. Wow, those are great words, aren't they? Peace. Do not fear, you shall not die. There are so many circumstances in life where we need to know that that's the word of God. Peace, do not fear, you shall not die. There's many times in my life when I've been in a situation uh, where I've needed to hear those words ringing in my heart. So Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it, the Lord is peace. To this day, it's still in Ophrah of the Abiezrites. <clears throat> you know, that word there that Gideon said, that he spoke, the Lord is peace, that is another I am word. He literally said, I am peace. Jehovah Shalom. And I want to talk a little bit about this word shalom with you today. I want you to understand the power of the word shalom. 
we often translate it peace, but peace is a very inadequate way to define and express this powerful, powerful word, shalom. We often think of peace as the absence of conflict. Oh, I wish I had peace with my neighbor. Doesn't mean you want to be best buddies, just means you want the racket next door to stop. You understand? Or when you think of peace with a nation, it isn't that you want necessarily to have the best trading agreement in the world with the neighboring nation. You just don't want to be at war. You know, when we think of North and South Korea, uh, the tension there, you know, staring at each other, fully armed across that border, and we think we want peace in the world, we want disarmament. But shalom is so much more than the absence of conflict, so much more than the absence of anxiety or worry or fear or turmoil or confusion. It isn't just God taking something away. He is shalom. He says, I am shalom. And we have to understand the significance of the names of God. Because in the scripture, name means nature. I want you to say that after me, okay? And you can say that without spreading any germs or you don't have to shout it or sing it. But I want you to say after me, name equals nature. Let's say that together. Name equals nature. So when you hear a name in the scripture, when God reveals himself with a name, he's revealing something about himself. So when God says, I am shalom, he is saying that in himself, in his being, his essence and his nature is this incredible entity of peace. And shalom is a remarkable word. There's so many attempts to define it. it. The central idea is wholeness. It means nothing missing, nothing broken. Other meanings include completeness, harmony, favor, health, prosperity, rest, welfare, satisfaction, safety, can you see that we struggle to translate it? Sometimes it's just better to use the word, isn't it? When you, when you meet someone, you can say peace to you. But if you say shalom, wow, that takes it to another level because you're saying all of those things. I invoke upon you what is in God. God is the God of wholeness, health, blessing, success, prosperity, nothing missing, nothing bo- broken, Nothing out of sync. And it's important to see that shalom is in God. It's not simply an ideal that we strive for in humanity. It's found inside God himself. And the other thing is we have to understand is that when God created men and women, he made us with shalom. Selah. (laughs) He made you and me. He made Adam and Eve in a complete state of harmony. When he made them, there was nothing out of kilter. Their relationship was shalom. Their bodies were shalom. Their environment was shalom. Their mind, their thoughts was shalom. They lived in a state of harmony, completeness, and wholeness. I have great issue with people who struggle with the idea that God wants to bless them. Because blessing and shalom is in God. And to know God is to experience a restoration of what sin robbed you of. Sin deprived mankind of a relationship with God 
in which was harmony, wholeness, peace, well-being, <clears throat> healing, health, good relationships. It's not God that denied us those things. It's sin. And when you come to know God, he embarks, you embark with him on a journey into wholeness. When the sin issue is dealt with in your life, you begin to experience healing in every area of your being. My journey, I wrote this in my uh, ministry newsletter this week, my journey as a young man, when I came to know the Lord at the age of 12, the trajectory of my journey as a Christian all these years, the trajectory, the direction of travel of my journey has been out of fear, out of worry, out of insecurity, out of anger, out of our anxiety, the trajectory of my journey has been into shalom, <clears throat> increasingly. My marriage, you know, when we, when we got married, um, we, we, you know, we really discovered how broken we each were. <laughs> you know, we were broken people, and marriage put two broken people together on a journey. And uh, I, I, I say, you know, the first 10 years were the most difficult. <laughs> I don't mean we didn't have a good marriage. We love each other, but boy, you know, marriage shows up your heart because your inner intense relationship. We've been married 34 years now. I'm more in love with my wife. I'm a better husband. She's a better wife. We're a better couple. We're, we, we have learned so much together. We're experiencing increasing measures of shalom in our marriage, in our relationship. There's a harmony. We, we hum together. Amen? Shalom. You know, I, I discovered a really interesting verse in um, Deuteronomy 27, verse 6, where the Lord is describing how the people of Israel should um, build their altar of offering. And there's this extraordinary little verse because I, I did a study of the, of the word shalom. I went through my concordance. Every word, every time shalom appears in the Old Testament, I found that scripture and looked it up. And I came across this one and I read something amazing. And it says, the Lord said, you shall build an altar to the Lord your God of uncut stones and you shall offer burnt offerings on it to the Lord your God. Now that word uncut stones, the word is shalom. He says, you shall build an altar of shalom stones. Isn't that amazing? What does it mean? It means you, you'll get those stones and you won't cut them. You won't break them. You won't chip them. Those stones are complete. They're whole. They're unbroken stones. And you'll make that altar of, un, of shalom stones. That is an incredible description of this word shalom. <clears throat> Jesus came to reverse the cycle of destruction that sin and Satan had unleashed in the world. Jesus came to bring shalom. And Isaiah 9 verse 6, we know this, Scripture. We read it at Christmas a lot, but let me read it to you as it should be read. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Shalom. Jesus is the Prince of Shalom. He's the one who came out from heaven warring to bring peace, warring against sin, warring against every enemy in your life, warring, battling against Satan, battling against death, battling against fear, battling against every curse. And he's the Prince of Shalom. And when Jesus comes to you, when God ministers to you, he doesn't just like spoon out a bit of Shalom. He doesn't just give it like medicine. When Jesus gives you shalom, he gives you himself because 
Shalom is found in God. It's not something he dispenses. Our son, Ben, you know, this morning he had his Weetabix. <clears throat> That's why he's getting so big and strong, because he has his Weetabix. And he likes to have honey on his Weetabix. We all, I mean, I don't know what you have on your Weetabix, sugar or syrup. Ben likes honey. So I have to get a big spoonful of honey. And you know what honey is like? It's so like viscous, you have to wait half an hour for it to sort of run off the spoon. And I'm, I'm kind of going like this, willing it to come off the spoon. And, and, and then I give him what's left on the spoon and he, you know, he satisfies himself with that spoonful of honey. We often think, you know, when we say, Lord, give me peace, peace in my situation, peace in my life, peace in my body, peace in my relationship, that God is going to come along with this sort of jar of honey piece, you know, and say, there you go, have a spoonful of shalom. My friend, he doesn't do that because his name is his nature. He is Jehovah, shalom. Do you understand what I'm saying? God doesn't just give you a little bit of peace like a spoonful of honey and then says, oh, go on then, lick the spoon. You know, I'm, I'm feeling kind today. He gives you himself. He gives you himself. You see, the thing about the names of God is this. They indicate the nature of God. You say, Lord, provide for me. He gives you himself, and in him is everything you need. When you say, Lord, guide me in this situation. I need guidance. I need wisdom. He says, well, I am your shepherd. I am Jehovah Rohi. I am your shepherd. Guidance, wisdom, security, everything you need is in me. What we have to do is taste and see that the Lord is good. You know, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. So when you, take, when you ask God for your little spoonful of shalom, he's not going to give you a spoonful of shalom. He's going to give you a bucket full of himself. <laughs> he's going to give you himself. Because in him is shalom. In him is all that you need. Glory to God. You know what? It's really, it's really quite a novel to be, to be speaking to people now. <laughs> I'm a little confused. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Because you, can't, you guys in the camera, you can't appreciate this. But actually, for the first time in four months, we're here together. Um, guys... Give, give everybody in the camera a big clap. Come on. <laughs> I, I hope those of you that are watching could hear real applause from real people in a real space. And uh, we, we are just so blessed, aren't we? Uh, it's just so great, you know, to, to be together in just a small way today. So praise God. Oh, my gosh. Praise the Lord. Woo. Isaiah 53, verse 5. We know this one really well. <clears throat> he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us shalom was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. The more you feed on Christ, the more you drink of his spirit, the more you taste of the Father's love, the more you will live in a restored condition of shalom. It will come into your home. It will come into your mind. It will come into your heart. It will come into your emotions. It will come into your relationships. You will take the peace of God into your workplace you'll take the peace of God into your laptop as you sit at home working online. <laughs> you'll take the peace of God into shops. You'll take the peace of God everywhere with you. Oh, glory to God. You see, shalom displaces the darkness. Shalom displaces the fear. Shalom displaces the sin. Shalom displaces the anxiety. 
I've told this story a number of times to you. I love gardening, but I'm, I wasn't a natural gardener. Who is? It's very interesting to watch people as they grow older, isn't it? I, you know, our children, our first three, never showed any interest in, in the garden. But as soon as you buy a house, this strange thing happens, you know. You watch this with your children. They buy a house and they look at this piece of land and this thing comes on them. And suddenly they start talking to you about plants. You know, I think, Dad, you know, I think the winter jasmine would go really nice in this corner. Is that my son talking? The guy who used to kick his football all over my flower beds, you know, and think I was going crazy if I said, you know, hey, guys, just watch where the ball goes. What? What, Dad? You know, and now, you know, they're talking about plants and shrubs. But, you know, when I had my first house, I started to weed my garden. And I couldn't couldn't get rid of the weeds. I just couldn't get rid of these weeds. They kept coming back, and my garden backed onto farmland. Our our daughter's got a house that reminds me of that house, because her house backs onto farmland. It's It's beautiful in South Staffordshire. She You look out in the house, you know, and we look out over the fields and they're they're really, you know, the same, the same, she's been infected with the same thing. You know, they're out there and the garden is this big project, you know, they're laying lawns and putting up fences and patios and and shrubs and borders. And and it's just so funny to watch this. Any, any, any people with grown up children seen this thing happen? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. And I said, my mum, you know, she was the consummate gardener, incredible gardener. So I said, Mum, come round and help me. So she came round, went into the back garden with me, and she said, Son, the idea is to put flowers and shrubs in the borders, and then there won't be any room for the weeds. And I thought, she's right. <laughs> the idea is to plant things. I'm battling to remove weeds. If I had filled my borders... With, with plants and flowers and shrubs, they would, they would displace the weeds. You know, a lot of things in your life will take care of themselves when you get filled with shalom. Instead of battling against the negative things, God says, be filled. You see? Be filled with the Holy Spirit is the way to lead the Christian life. Be filled with the love of God is the way to displace anger, offense, hurt, worry, fear, because John says perfect love casts out fear. He doesn't say, look, I'm going to give you these big weapons and you can battle against your fear. Here's a sword and here's a shield. Now, how's it going in your battle against fear? He says, the love of God displaces it. Amen. The love of God displaces it. You see, he is your shalom. He is your shalom. Praise the Lord. Amen. Are you getting something from this today? Hallelujah. I'm, I'm, I'm going to round this up. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish there. I think we've, we've gone far enough. But let me, let me finish by saying this. Let me switch my little notes off there. <clears throat> There is so much fear in the world right now. COVID-19 has infected the world with fear. There is a pandemic of fear, not just coronavirus. And as the people of God, we should not be defined by fear. Be wise, be careful, be prudent, of course. And in meeting together, we are being very careful with the measures that we're taking. And I'm so, so blessed that we could do this today. And next week, we'll go up a level. You can attend the service by registering. And and it's like when you're registered, that means we can do track and trace. But we have a capacity and you can, you can register. And it isn't just church members. It's whoever. We, we welcome our city into this space. In fact, I'd prefer that the church members, you know, allow the visitors to come in because there's so much fear and people want a different word in our city. They want a different voice. 
And the people of God should not be leading the way in fear. You know, uh, Sarah was saying she went to Ikea. We went to Ikea the other day. I didn't know what I was going to find. When I got there, the car park, you know, was, was, like, was like military like military precision. Everyone was like really, really keeping their distance. So well behaved. You know what? We got in those doors and it was chaos. Like <laughs> pe- people, hey, watch it, mate, you know, and like pushing trolleys around, bumping into each other. It was so funny. You know, it was like, it was like, in the shop, you know, they got that trolley in front of them. That, that, was, their, that was their COVID-19 barrier. They're going to push that trolley and move people out the way. You know, I've got my face mask, but most of all, I've got my trolley. You know, I thought they were going to put spikes on the front of it, you know, and, and out the way, you know. And, and it was chaos in there. I want to tell you, this is, this is safer than Ikea. This is safer than Sainsbury's. <laughs> This is safer than Asda. Amen. (laughs) I want to say it again. The healthy are not going to come here to get sick. The sick are going to come here to get healed. And there is a prophetic word and a power of God in this place that we believe healing wells are here. You know, but the most important thing is what are you carrying into the world? Are you carrying fear? Are you carrying shalom? What are you carrying? Are you carrying anxiety? Are you carrying worry? You know, guys, listen, it's okay to carry your mask. It's okay to carry your sanitizer. It's okay to carry your wipes, but don't carry fear. You can carry all that stuff in your bag, but please don't carry fear in your heart because it's time to rise up and dispel the fear that has gripped the world. The newspapers, the media, they want clickbait, they want sales, they want your attention, and the way they get it is through peddling fear and anxiety and worry. But the people of God will not be defined by fear. I want to finish by reading to you what God said to Gideon once more. He said this. Peace be with you. Shalom be with you. Do not fear. You shall not die. And it's time to hear the word of the Lord and not the word of the media. Let's, you know, please don't misquote me, guys, okay? (laughs) Don't misquote me. I'm well aware of what's going on. I am in constant contact with pastors and leaders all around the world. We have sent aid and still sending aid, hundreds of dollars to different nations to to Pakistan, to India, Nepal, Philippines, Mozambique, Zimbabwe. We are sending relief to to believers and churches who've been devastated and affected by coronavirus. We are doing that. We are mindful of the devastation, but we will not be defined by fear. And I want to say to you, if you're watching today, we're going to close in prayer, but if you're watching today and you don't know Jesus then I invite you to, invite, to ask the Prince of Peace into your heart, the Prince of Shalom, the one who comes and he comes and he invades your heart with peace and shalom and wholeness. And if you are troubled by fear and anxiety and worry, Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. Be at peace. Be still and know that I'm God. Shalom, I am shalom, Jehovah shalom is the word over you today. So I want you, wherever you are, whether you're in the room here or at home, to just lift your hands to the Lord, and I'm going to pray that you will be a carrier of shalom. You will experience his shalom, and wherever you go, you will not be afraid. You will be bold and strong you will know that the Lord your God is with you. 
you will experience shalom, protection, healing, and health. You will minister shalom to your family. You will not talk up the fear. You will be able to say to every raging storm, peace, be still, be made whole, be encouraged, be assured. And I want to declare that over you today, over your home, over your family, over your loved ones. Your children will go to school without fear. They will come home without fear. They will not bring sickness into your home. Your children will be peace. You will minister shalom to your children, to your loved ones, to your neighbors. You will be a harbinger, a herald of peace. You will be the bringer of peace to your neighbors. They will see you living, shielded supernaturally, guarded by the power of God, protected by the shalom of God. I prophesy these things over you. And if you don't know Jesus, the Prince of Peace, the Prince of Shalom today, then I ask you to open your heart right now and let him in because he died on the cross. We've read it there. He he took the punishment of our sin so that you could receive the shalom of God because salvation is shalom. It's not just sins forgiven. It's That's the starting point for you to experience the promises and provision of God in your life. Say this prayer after me. If you don't know Jesus, pray this prayer in your heart. Even if in the room today there are people here that don't know Jesus, pray this prayer after me. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you today. You can pray this in the room with me. That you love me. That you sent Jesus to die in my place on the cross. That I might be forgiven of all my sin and experience the shalom of God. And I receive you now into my heart, into my life. Forgive me, heal me, rescue me. Restore me. Thank you that you answer my prayer and I will follow you as your disciple today. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer, you know, at home or somewhere, then you send in your comment. And let us know. If there's anyone in the room that prayed that prayer, give us a wave. If you received Jesus, just give us a wave. Give us a wave at home. Let us know. Just say, I gave my life to Jesus. So we bless you. Thank you for watching today. Thank you for being here. We've got 40 people in the room. We're going to nudge it up. We know our capacity. We know our safe capacity. And we want to assure you, and we are excited to welcome you in the room and online. And if we reach our capacity and people still want to come, then we'll consider doing two services. But right now, we're just taking baby steps, and we thank you so much for this expression of faith. God bless you. Have a great day. Let's give Jesus one last big clap, shall we? Thank you. Amen. He's the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. Hallelujah. Woo! We give him praise.